Well, hello and welcome, Electus Society community. This is the final training for the level two of our advanced executive leadership program. Uh, I actually am very proud of the updates that I made to this training. It's much more comprehensive than I've ever done before. I go into a lot more depth. Uh, especially we're going to be talking about the manifestation formula, and I go into depth on each one. So I hope that you enjoy it. What we're going to do is we're going to basically learn all these different principles on how to apply it both in your life, your career, and then just at the tail end, we'll talk a little bit about politics. Again, I don't know if you ever want to get into politics, but it's something that we should all be aware of. Listen, if we're all developing leaders and, and us as leaders don't step onto the plate, whether it's part of your PTA, whether it's a local homeowners association, whether it's a council person or whatever, maybe you're actually helping other great leaders. I think that's important for you to know some of those key concepts in terms of winning an election. Again, I don't go into depth, but I just give you a little bit of taste of an iceberg, and especially the lessons I learned from running into for politics when I was in student government, as well as uh, when I worked in government a little bit. So what are we, what are going to be the learning outcomes for today's session? Learning the manifestation formula. So anything that you would like in your life, personal, career, money, anything, what do you have to do in order to make that happen? Uh, how to overcome the haters in your life, meaning there's a lot of people in your life that says, you can't do this, uh, you know, it doesn't work, it's impossible, you should be doing X, you know, but your heart is telling you you should be doing Y. So what can you do about those individuals? And then learn the characteristics of a winning team, again, because we're stronger together than that we would alone. So I'm going to kind of recap on some of the principles that you learned in level one. And then I'm going to talk about other key principles in winning, especially as part of a team. There's a famous book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And so I'm just going to pull out some of those key principles that you can apply in your life. But then I'm actually going to give it a critique of that book, right? There's an other leadership book that you should all be aware of right now. I'm going to give my top leadership book recommendations, but it really jumps into this topic between that there's two types of leaders or types of people. There's the personality uh, ethic versus the character ethic. And I'm going to give you an example in the difference between the two. Uh, I'm going to, you're going to learn lessons from the greatest basketball player of all time. And then again, we're going to end with discover the seven steps to win an election. So let's jump right in. Here is the manifestation formula for you to achieve anything you want in your life. It starts off with a vision, a clear picture of what you want to achieve. You have to actually believe that it's possible because you don't know how many times people have self-doubt and all this programming from our childhood and things like that from the culture, from our environment, from our friends, from our family that we can't achieve the impossible and that holds us back. And then you need to have emotion in order to make it happen. So you can't just think your way into your future. You actually have to feel it on an emotional level. And there, there's some people are really motivated and accomplish a lot of different things, but from a destructive level, right, you know, uh, out of harming others, I'm going to actually share with you how you can actually tap into a constructive aspect of your emotions and that your manifestations will happen even faster. Uh, I can personally tell you from personal experience. Again, I've been wanting to have Electa Society in existence for a long time, but it never came through. But the moment that I made a decision that I wanted to just give this all this knowledge away and help people, that's when it started to take off, you know. And as the time of this recording, we have over 200 members, over 67 have gone through the program, you know, 14 people have completed level two, and we have another about, you know, 10 to 14 more people uh, are going to complete level two, you know, within the next month or so after they watch all these recordings. So it's really exciting. Um, in terms of, and then the final thing is once you have all those three components, it's continuous action. It's having that commitment. And just, and like, I love that image of that ax, you know, remember I keep using that analogy, even though I love trees, but if you just keep hammering at the same thing over and over again, you can't help but uh, accomplish amazing things. And just imagine, if this is just operating as an individual, but if everybody operated this together and you did it as a team, again, there's nothing uh, that's limiting, limiting you that you can accomplish amazing things, right? So let's kind of do a refresher. We learned this in level one. How do you create a vision? 
you meditate, you actually see a, a picture of what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, you have to write it down in your journal somewhere you need to have it written. Maybe you put it on the mirror. Some people create a vision board. We learned that from Steve Harvey. Uh, and then you have to actually see it, use it, uh, you know, see as much as possible. Remind yourself, think about it, visualize it in the morning and in the night. These are the things that are going to help you to manifest it much quicker and faster. Then I'm actually going to share with you an example of this. Some of you may know Jim Carrey. He's a famous comedian. But I'm going to show you a clip of a video of he was really, really poor and he he wanted to be a movie star. So I just wanted to show you what are the kind of things based on this manifestation formula that he did in order to make it possible. So let's check it out right now. Okay, okay. Obviously, you knew, obviously you knew somewhere inside yourself that you were destined to be famous because I think Hold on, we're having a little internet connection problem. Let's start from the beginning. Okay, okay. Obviously you knew, obviously you knew somewhere inside yourself that you were destined to be famous because I think hmm. really a marvelous thing, that visualization thing you did. Do mm -hmm. y'all you you read about this or hear this? That you used to go up on Mulholland Drive and park yeah, every night. and visualize seeing yourself as... Yeah, I would visualize... Uh, yeah, I would this visualize... This is when you were broke and poor. Right, having mm -hmm. directors interested in me and people that I respected uh, um, saying, you know, I like your work or mm -hmm. whatever that is. And, and uh, I would visualize things coming to me that I wanted or whatever. This and, was in like 1987, 85. Yeah. 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 And, and I you... had nothing at that time. So it was like, it, but it just made me feel better. It made me at that time, all it really was for me was kind of making me feel better. I would drive home and think, well, I do have these things and they're out there. I just don't have a hold of them yet, but they're out there. Okay. So you would get this from what? Self-help books or whatever? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Self-help section. Self-help section. <laughs> they renamed it the Jim Carrey <laughs> wing. <laughs> So didn't you write yourself a check? I heard yeah. that you did. Is that true? I wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered. And I gave myself uh, five years or three years, maybe. And uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet and I kept it there and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and uh, but then just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on, I think it was Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. yeah. So you visualize yourself like... Visualization works if you work hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's that the thing. You, you can't hard. just visualize yeah. and then, you know, go eat a sandwich. <laughs> I love that. That was such a powerful moment. So you can see that even the most successful celebrity, Jim Carrey, he was able to do this, right? Had the visualization, was able to, um, you know, write out that check. Uh, again, what's not shared in that story, he was living at his car at some point. So my question to all of you is with respect to whatever you want to achieve in your life, have you written it out, right? Do you actually visualize it, right? Notice how even in that story with Jim Carrey was actually sharing, he's like, sometimes he didn't even feel it, but actually going on Mulholland Drive, looking at the view and feeling that he actually had that $10 million and stuff like that, and then con taking continuous action to make it happen, that's what ac actually made it realistic. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So we talked about vision, and now we're going to jump into belief. Now, remember from level one, we talked about Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, if you can think about the most difficult task that you could ever actually face, an addiction where people, you know, uh, sell uh, all their mother's parents' belongings, anything to help solve that addiction, right? Destroy people, everybody they love in their life. It's that they have no control. Well, in the 12 step program, it is the most successful program to help people deal with this addiction. And I talked to you about the, the number two. Um, you know, uh, rule or, or step 
of the Hulkaholics Anonymous is to believe in a power greater than themselves. And so what they actually said is this power could be God, it could be whatever you want it to call it, but it's the only way that if you tap into this power, do you now actually have control over your destiny, o -o over this addiction. And so I also share with you is that, again, I respect anybody who's watching this, whatever their faith, you know, Muslim, Jewish, you know, even agnostic, atheist, that's okay. But there are different terms to define this, this power, right? You can call it your consciousness, your intuition, your gut, your Holy Spirit, your I am presence, right? Uh, you know, in the name of God is I am that I am. So it's like, what is it about I am like this person that you're looking at, when you look in the mirror, you know, you're alive, and you have this deep power within you that many times people don't really tap into. And so this is what I really want to bring to the forefront. And it's in all the different movies and TV shows that we talk about that they're trying to get you to actually see this. And remember from level one, we talked about uh, Wayne Dyer. He did an interview with Oprah and he says, manifestation happens faster if your alignment with your source. Again, we're using these different terms because you know maybe the term God is really outdated to where we are in terms of our culture and our society. It's not just this white guy in a robe up there in the sky, but it's something even greater, right? And he said that you need to attract something into your life that you're in, not what you actually want. So you actually have to embody in terms of your emotion and feeling. If you want a partner in your life, and you're like, oh, I want this other kind of person. Well, are you acting and behaving in the way that's going to actually attract that person in your life? Uh, you know, I, I've met a lot of different women through my my uh, my wife's different friends that are actually trying to find husbands, and that they say that it's so difficult. Why aren't there any good men out there? Right? They spent a lot of their life, you know, uh, their twenties and thirties dating, and and now they're in their late thirties and they want to settle down, and they're starting to discover and very frustrated that they can't find a good man or a good partner, and and they're just mad and angry at the men. Well, it's like, well, there are a lot of good men out there in those cases for for those individuals but it's like who are you being and acting when you're around those people are you judging them criticizing them saying that they're not good enough you know are you going to the club to meet people or you're actually going to you know uh, friends houses you know churches you know yoga studios all these other kind of you know different kind of places to actually meet people and uh i thought that this was so interesting you know i can't remember where i saw it but you know, uh, I was talking about it with my wife. She says that the moment, if you have different friends that are girls, right? Let's say if you're a girl and you have different friends and that they're looking for somebody, if you meet a guy that you say, wow, this person is educated, works hard and is nice, you know, uh, guess what? that friend is going to do everything she can <laughs> to try to match you up with her friend who's single, you know, you know, why spend all this time flicking through different things if you could actually tap into your, uh, your network uh, uh, of, of, of maybe your friends that want to actually find you a partner. But again, it takes a lot of self-reflection and discipline to say, are you vibrating? Are you operating at a level that the, the, the type of men or the person that you're looking for is going to be attracted to you? Again, I'll keep going. If you feel depressed, don't say I am depressed. Those are the most powerful words in the English language. I am. You'll get more depression. Say I am fulfilled, even if your senses tell you otherwise, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to program our brain, program our mind, program our heart to focus in and be that which we actually want. So let's talk about emotions a little bit uh, deeper. So in order for you to manifest you want you actually have to feel it. You have to uh, have an emotion. So whenever you want a goal, you can't just say, you know what, I want to make $500,000, a million dollars. What does that mean? That doesn't, that's not tangible. That's not real. Like you just hear it because that's what everybody wants to be millionaires, billionaires, whatever it is. But until you actually make the moment and decide why you want to make that million dollars and so that it actually makes a difference, that emotion is what's going to actually drive you to actually achieve it. And I'm actually looking on my bookshelf. I think uh, it was the book called The One Minute Millionaire that I talked about in terms of, you know, all the different ways to make money. And I, again, forgive me if I'm not quoting the book exactly correct. But right now, 
the question would be, you know, if I were to ask each one of you, how long would it take for you to make a million dollars? You might say, oh, maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and stuff like that. This is all in terms of your belief. But what if you found out that a relative had cancer? Okay. A uh, most unique cancer and anything like that doctors like, you know, don't even have or find it's not very common. And they, that, that loved one needed a medical procedure and it costed a million dollars. Do you think that if you were the only person that was able to actually help raise those funds, that God knows you would find some way to help get them that procedure. So you'd be picking up the phone, calling people, having conversations. So then the fact that you have that motivation and drive because there's there's a loved one that you care about so much, guess what? You could end up accomplishing amazing things that your, your mind can't even comprehend. What you're capable of is because of that emotion is what's going to help manifest it. And if it's a constructive emotion, you're going to manifest it much faster versus if it's, it's a destructive emotion, like trying to harm somebody or criticize somebody. So again, I share with all of you, I learned a lot about manifestation and, and a lot of different spirituality from this book, you know, Unveiled Mysteries by Godfrey Ray King. And I, I want to pull out some quotes from it because I thought that it was really relevant. And here was this line again, the eternal law of life is what you think and feel you bring into form. Okay. Where your thought is there you are for you are the consciousness and what you meditate upon you become. Okay. So profound. And then again, more about the negative emotions. When you allow your mind to dwell upon thoughts of hate, uh, you know, uh, criticism, condemnation, lust, envy, jealousy, fear, doubt, and suspicion, guess what? You allow these feelings of irritation to generate within you, and you will certainly have discord, have failure, have disaster, not only in your mind, in your body and your world. Again, I thought that was really, really so profound because guess what happens? It all starts off with your mind, right? You're wanting to be doing something. In this case, this person's riding a horse, but then you start having these little thoughts. Oh, what if I fall down? What happens? Like, oh, what if you start worrying about different things? Those thoughts start to repeat, and then suddenly you become distrustful. I don't know about this horse. You know, I, I don't know if it's actually safe. And guess what? That distrust turns into suspicion, and now you've moved from thoughts to actually emotions right here. And now you're feeling suspicion. You're feeling distrust. And guess what happens? Something bad happens. Uh, you, you know, you basically self-destructed. And I don't know if this is just me or if this has anything to do with you, anytime, and I've shared this before, but it's worth repeating, anytime I've been anxious, in a rush, trying to do something, having fear or anxiety or worry, guess what happens? I forget things, I drop things, I spill things, I trip on things. It's like, oh my goodness, it's almost like clockwork and predictable that, that terrible things happen. It's like, what kind of state was I being at that moment that I'm starting to have all these kind of breakdowns in areas of my life? So just think about this in terms of anything that you want to uh, achieve in your life. You know, how are you supposed to achieve that if you're so if you have all these destructive emotions that you're self sabotaging you from actually uh, achieving what you want? And so remember from, from a refresher from level one, I talked about belief. And the, I showed a clip from the movie, The Dark Knight Rises, you know, and the quote goes like this. He's escaping the, 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 the this cave, right, where, it, you know, there's no hope whatsoever. He tries to jump and, uh, you know, across to the other side, keeps falling down. He's tied by a rope and he keeps trying and trying. He keeps failing. And then at one point he's talking with this guy he's, and the guy tells him fear is why you fail. How can you move uh, uh, faster than the possible, you know, fight longer than possible without the most powerful impulse, the impulse of the spirit? Again, I, I'm just sharing with you like this, th these messages are trying to teach you coded in movies and TV shows. And I'm just trying to pull it out, you know, uh, to actually show you this. And what does he do? 
uh, he actually believes it's so uh, possible that he actually gets rid of the rope. And then right before he jumps, he closes his eyes and without any consequences, you know, it's like he has to, there's no choice. He jumps and he ends up making it. And again, watching this movie was very profound for me in my career because I was working at the National Society of Leadership and Success at the time. And I was working to try to hit my goals for my job. And I was one, one person short of that goal to try to get celebrity guest speakers. And I was being told by the president that, Tim, if you don't do this, this is not good. This is not good for you and your position. You, you know, you're expected to do this. And I thought I was going to be fired and fail. And it was watching this movie that it says, no, I have everything inside me and I'm capable to get that speaker, to get that person. And I just started pounding away on the phones, reaching out to the people not thinking about a nine to five job, whatever it took. And guess what? I got that person, you know, and it had to take that in order to have that belief in yourself. And the same thing with, with Neo from the matrix, I showed that clip about belief. There's a scene where Morpheus says that they're in the program. You just have to believe. And he jumps and, and, and he's able to do it, but guess what? Neo tries it. He's like, come on, let's psych myself up again. And he tries to jump and then he falls. And so they think, oh my goodness, maybe he's not the one he didn't believe himself. And the reason why I bring this up, because it's so difficult, like all of us have doubts, all of us have fears, you know, it's very easy for Morpheus to say you have to let all of that go the fears, the doubts, the disbeliefs free your mind. But guess what, it takes a lot of practice. That's why we're in this life to help eliminate our fears. And so it's only after uh, different trials and tribulations throughout the movie that he actually then believes that he has what it takes to actually save Morpheus, right, from the bad guys, from the machines, the AI machines, and he does it. So again, this is has to apply to you and everybody in your life. It's why isn't that they are achieving what they, they are achieving? Do they actually believe in themselves? So again, here's the uh, analogy that I was taught in order for you to manifest what you want. You have to imagine that anytime you want something, it is simply a journey, okay? You're at point A in your home and you want to get to uh, uh, to Y. You've never been there. You've never traveled before. And so what do people do? They get in the car and they go. But what happens is like, am I really going to get there? Oh my goodness, there's an accident here. Uh, maybe I should turn around. Oh my goodness, there's a storm coming. So do you see how all these fears end up coming and preventing you from wanting to meet or get to your destination? Right? You had an expectation that you're like, it's supposed to be an hour drive, but it's already 45 minutes and I haven't even, you know, left my town and what's going on. Maybe this is not meant to be. And so you have all this negative talk that's preventing you from ha happening. But guess what? Go back to the manifestation formula. If you have the vision of that, you have this destination you want to go. If you believe that it's possible, right, that that destination exists, if there's an emotional reason why you need to get there, right, you know, visit your loved ones, whatever it is, guess what? Just take action. Start driving. Okay, you know what? You know what? Here's a block. Okay, I'll, let me find a new route. And that's the journey of life in order for you to get where you want. And you're going to learn and grow from that experience and you're going to become a better driver. But here's the thing. All of us have smartphones. All of us have GPSs, right? And so what I would assert for all of you is your GPS, your map, is your higher self, right? You know, some people debate whether there's free will or, or do you have a destiny? And I, uh, it was great because there was this one uh, speaker uh, who I'm forgetting his name now, but he says, well, what if your, what if your uh, uh, destiny is basically the free will of your higher self? Maybe that's their plan that they want for you. So again, I've, I've tried to apply that into my life that maybe my higher self has chosen this path and that things would get easier and I'd have a lot more confidence if I just simply followed the GPS, right? And guess what? Just like life, the GPS leads you and you're like, oh my goodness, the GPS led me wrong. Oh my goodness, there's an accident here. You know what? Guess what? It took me to this destination. I have to turn around and go somewhere else. But guess what? That is also part of the experience. What are you going to learn from actually 
going to that destination. You know, uh, oh, I got to see monuments. I got to see sites that I had never seen before. Who knows? You know, maybe you see an accident and you get out of the car and you're able to help somebody, right? I can't describe all the intricate reasons why things happen to us to the way they, they happen, but I adopt the attitude that everything is a learning lesson. And so uh, anytime I'm trying to make a decision, I try to quiet my mind. I try to listen to that inner voice that's inside me, which is inside all of you to say, what should I do? And if you can silence out the noise, the ego, all the fears, anxieties, it will tell you what to do. And sometimes that means doing things that you're terrified of doing. I've shared with you all throughout Elective Society, my personal stories, my struggles with my relationships, with my job, all those fears when I faced the dragon, when I faced those fears and was guided by my higher self on what to do, what to say, guess what? As terrifying it was and at, at that moment, I got an extra sense of courage and power and ease and happiness when I did that, right? Like that I didn't know before. Again, nobody is teaching this to me or never. nobody ever taught me when I was in college going to this leadership programs about listening to motivational speakers. I think now because we're in the new age that more and more people are recognizing that there is, they call it the universe, the power, whatever that is guiding us and you need to tap into it and you're the creator of your destiny that we're becoming much more empowered than we've ever been before so i think things are progressing even though sometimes if you ever read the news <laughs> things look like uh, are getting worse and worse so uh, i'm gonna have, have a video that i'm going to show you okay and i'm gonna want us to have a quick discussion so from the idea idea of you have a vision you have a belief that it's possible you have emotion that's constructive and take action you can man manifest anything so what happens when you use this power? You can call it God, you call it your higher self, your consciousness, your instinct, your inner power, your strength, whatever, confidence, courage, whatever term you want to call it, you know, I let it up to you. And you use that power to accomplish something constructive, especially if it's coming from love or some other constructive, positive emotion. Wow, you can't believe what you're going to be able to accomplish. And I would say, quote, you would become superhuman. And why is it that with all these movies that keep coming about, uh, about superheroes and things like that, why hasn't this industry died off? <laughs> why are people not tired yet of watching these superhero, superhero movies with all these special powers? Now, again, I know people can give some critiques of some of the most late, latest shows that are coming on television and things like that, but still people uh, yearn for this. Why? I think, let me make an assertion. I think deep down inside of us, we all know that we have superhuman powers, right? But it's up, it's up to us to actually let go of the gates, the walls, the prisons of our own mind that allow us to tap into uh, these powers that we can accomplish great things. And I think there's nothing more beautiful than this earth and this human experience. You know, if they say that, you know, we're all living in the simulation, well, guess what? That's fine with me. We're in this video game called life and it's time for us to level up, <laughs> okay? So that you can accomplish more and greater and become self-actualized. And you're not gonna do it unless you're taught this and that you actually put it into practice. So I actually have a video and this is a woman by the name of T Tamika and she's on the subway and there's a man that is trying to hurt this woman and her baby. And I want you to watch it because uh, uh, to see what she does and how she does it and, and, and what she taps into. Okay, so let's watch this right now. It's very powerful. Story you're seeing first on Fox, new dramatic video showing the kindness of a stranger. Police say it sheds some light on a string of bizarre incidents on Septa's Broad Street line. You can see a bystander as she helps protect a young woman and her baby from a man authorities say would later go on to attack a Septa officer. Fox 29's Seanette Wilson talked to that good Samaritan tonight. Seanette? Well, Ian, this woman said she could not stand by and risk a mother and her newborn baby getting hurt. She stood between a man who later Later proved to be violent when police say he left this particular incident and attacked a septa cop soon after. 
Every time I was blocking him, I was saying the blood of Jesus is against you. Tamika Bates is the woman seen in this surveillance video on a SEPTA train, boldly standing between a woman holding her weak old baby girl and a man allegedly harassing her. I said, say the Lord God rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You will not touch this woman. Tamika says she and the woman both got on at Erie Avenue. She noticed the suspect who police have identified as 40-year-old Stephen Mason following the woman as she sat down, then got up and moved. He asked, could he see the baby? And she ignored him. Then he asked again, oh, you're not going to let me see the baby? And she looked up at him and said, no. So that upset him a little bit. Then he went to go reach to move the, blank, the, to move the blanket, but she shooed his hand away. As others sat by and watched, Tamika says she felt compelled to help. And I said, miss, just stay with me and I'll protect you. I have you covered. Don't worry. Watch the suspect standing behind Tamika as she moves side to side to shield the woman. She says Mason didn't appear to be right as he repeatedly tried to talk to the woman. He said, the rats are coming. They're coming to get us. They're coming to get us. Look, you need to go with me. When the train stopped at Susquehanna and Dauphin, Tamika who is a minister at Resurrection Evangelistic Church, said the woman broke down crying as she escorted her off the train. Mason stayed behind. I didn't fear what was in him because I knew the greater being within me could defeat what was actually in him. Incredible, right? So the mother was reportedly taking her baby to Temple Hospital because she wasn't breathing right when this happened. Tamika says knowing now what the suspect is accused of still would not change what she did to help that woman. Seanette Wilson, Fox 29 News. Dawn? Oh, my goodness. Every time I watch that, it almost moves me to tears. And uh, I just wanted to ask all of you or anybody who'd like to share, what did you get from watching this video. And let me just put a little disclaimer, right? I, I don't say that because I want to proselytize, right? I'm trying to say whether you have a belief, whether you're Jewish, Muslim, whatever, atheist. I just want to acknowledge that she tapped into something, right? You know, whatever word she chose, you know, she had happened to be a minister, so she chose that faith. But notice what she said, you know, the power in me is greater than the power of what he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, than what this guy is. And just to see that woman, you know, again, this big guy that she's holding the bars with such strength and she just refuses to let him actually touch her or, or protect her. This is the power of love, you know? So uh, does anybody else, you know, raise your hand or unmute yourself? Is there anything that you want to share what you got out from watching this video? So I'm not a very big person. Um, I'm a whopping five foot three. Um, <laughs> and I learned a long time ago that uh, you can be intimidating even if you're little. <laughs> yes. Um, and sometimes you can be more intimidating when you're little, but um, that's another commentary anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing is that if you, if you understand that your your faith can be bigger than your fear regardless yeah. of your religious beliefs mm -hmm. um you can stand up to somebody much larger than you um it has it has nothing to do with size it has everything to do with attitude more often than not and and Go 100%. Finish what you were going to say. I thought that was great. And, and especially, especially if you're a woman, mm -hmm. to have the attitude of, I'm not afraid of you. Yeah. Um, because a lot of times men who are exhibiting that kind of behavior, if you're afraid of them, that makes them feel like they're in control of the situation. And if, and if you stand up to that, they're just confused. <laughs> that reminds me of a spoiler. I won't say it, but in the, in that TV show, Yellowstone, there is a violent attack of rape and it's unsuccessful because of the power of this woman. So that, thank you, Beth. That's what it actually reminded me of, but I would agree with you 100%. You know, how many times in nature do we see this humongous dog terrified? of a little cat, right? You know, can't even go up the stairs, right? Or a little dog intimidating all these bigger dogs because there is something 
in that individual of a confidence and power that says, no, you, I, I, here's the line, right? And, and my question is, you all have that ability to tap into that. And especially if it's something for you love, it's, if it's for something constructive, right? And so knowing that this power exists, whatever you want to call it, whatever your faith, right? Tap into that and use it to accomplish amazing things. So again, uh, you know, uh, thank you guys for allowing me to share that video. I, I'm telling you that when I watch that, it always brings me to tears because I just know that all of us are capable into tapping into that higher force, that higher power. And again, <laughs> I've even seen some, even some creepy things where there was like an actual interview with an exorcist, right? Where people have dark forces inside them you know, where people's eyes turn black and yet the power of this individual in the good of love and God and stuff like that is able to like calm this person down and be able to like, you know, transform them. Like again, uh, maybe a, a time for another topic or interest, but again, it's just this power, all of you, you have it all within you. So let's jump into the next topic. Okay, so that's the manifestation formula. Let's jump into winning and winning as a team. So if you remember from level one, high performance communication, we talked about uh, all the different personality types. And then I said, one of my favorite books is by Pat Lincioni, who wrote several books, The Five Dysfunction of, of a Team and The Ideal Team Player, because guess what? We accomplish more together than we would alone. But who are the people that you want on your team, right? And he says, if you could boil it all down to three characteristics is you want people on your team that are humble, right? They don't have big egos. They're hungry, they're tenacious, they don't stop and they're people smart. They really get along with people. So I have these three images of the humility, right? From Puss in Boots, those, look at those beautiful eyes, that tenacity that even when this frog is being swallowed by this humongous bird, this frog is saying, oh, hell no, I'm not going down there. And it's choking the bird like that is what tenacity is. That's why people in sports made some of the best interns when I was working at the National Society of Leadership and Success is because they have that competitive spirit of, I want to win. I don't want to give up. I don't like losing. I've been recently watching clips of that movie with Billy Bean and the Oakland A's. Maybe somebody in the chat can re uh, remind me what movie that that is. Uh, uh, oh, Moneyball. I think that's it. Moneyball, where it's like, this guy didn't want to lose. And so how did this Oakland A team who didn't have access to the dollar or the money to be able to win a championship? Well, guess what? Billy Bean cared so much about a winning that he found a way. So his tenacity was amazing. And I'm also watching with my wife, a TV show called The Offer. It's about the producer who actually created The Godfather. Again, one of the most popular films of all time and what what kind of tenacity he had to face in order to get this film done even dealing with the mafia and people wanting to kill him in his life so again those are the type of people that you like to work with or or for you to develop that skill and then the last thing is people who are people smart people who have a high degree of emotional intelligence can they feel what another person is feeling can they put themselves in their shoes again learning how to communicate and talk with them uh, is, is going to be very important in order to be successful so doing a deep dive being humble you know my favorite quote from socrates and i love sharing it as part of the values of elective society the only true wisdom is that you know nothing <laughs> just and you know no i'm a big fan of game of thrones i love that line you know nothing john snow because everything that i'm sharing with you in these trainings guess what i could be wrong this is what i know up until this point in my life and who knows i already know that when i do this next year or do this next training i'm gonna have to update it i'm gonna make corrections and stuff like that so if we can just make a commitment to continuous learning then we'll all be good and again i this is a quote from my one of my teachers who i used to think was the devil she was my english teacher she was so tough and graded us so hard but she taught me all about how to do outlines and you know a whole year i can't remember anything she taught me but i remember this line smart people learn from their mistakes and smarter people learn from other people's mistakes so that's what i try to do and that's what i'm doing here with elective society sharing with you all my failures all my successes this is what i've done so that you 
can already be set up for success. And again, I shared with you, I had mentors, you know, I'm one of your mentors, just a, one of many to come. And these were the people that influenced my life to help me both in my college career, Dave Fields, Jay Hershenson, Charmaine, again, more people in college, Ted Hayes, Steve Kleinberg, all these people were instrumental. I learned so many lessons. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that they said was gold, right? That, you know, maybe I may have disagreed with them on a certain points, but that's okay. That's life, right? But take whatever you can from their wisdom and then apply it, test it, and use what works for you. When it came to my career, it was the National Society of Leadership and Success. The founder, Gary Turek, he was my mentor. I learned so much from him. To this day, when I coach people, I say, well, I had once a mentor who told me this, and I use that to help coach people. And, and again, you never know the, those things that people say that just stick in your brain. Chuck Knippen then became the president of NSLS. I learned all about time management and prioritization. It helped me become a very successful in my career. Sean Mater was my mentor and coach for Landmark Worldwide when I did that four-month leadership program. I did several programs where I had to coach, uh, you know, a bunches of different coaches and bunch of people, and I learned so much from him. And that's where I actually really gained my skills in terms of coaching and, and helping people. Uh, you know, when you start to have to coach hundreds of people every year, you get better and better at it. But then there's also the books that you have. Those are your mentors as well. You know, uh, in terms of spiritual books, Unveiled Mysteries, uh, if, I could if I could choose one book from each of these categories that I would recommend for all of you to read. And again, it's not the only book, uh, be all book. Again, there's many other books. I, I might act actually add spiritually the Bible on there, but reading this book inspired me to want to read the Bible and then other books. And, you know, I still have on my list to read the Quran and all these other kind of the, you know, the uh, uh, Baba Gadita, if I'm even pronouncing it right. Like there's so many spiritual texts that I now want to read, but this book really helped spark that for me. Uh, health prescription for nutritional healing. So everything about learning about nutrition and if you have any health ailments, wealth, rich dad, poor dad, thinking about the way that an asset is something that only puts money in your pocket. So if you want to be wealthy, then guess what? you know, buy things that are bringing you money predictably, not, 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 not like wishy-washy and hoping that they make you money. Leadership, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Again, the PhD manual on leadership, management, success. And then in terms of your career, like what are the different steps to be successful? I would say it's the success principles uh, by Jack Canfield. And, you know, the first, I remember principle number one, because it, out of all the, what was it? 64 principles he had in this book. The number one principle when you open it, page one, is says, take 100% responsibility for your life. So all the people that you meet that are playing the victim, that are unhappy in their marriage, their job, and stuff like that, uh, with their friends, their family, what are they doing? They're taking themselves as the victim of somebody else oppressing them, and you're never going to get anywhere if you don't recognize that you have an inner power, that you're the creator of your destiny, and once you actually decide that you're 100% responsible for everything that happens into your life, which is a big, big deal, okay, that's when you can actually make change. In a relationship, you're unhappy? Who has to fix it? Do they have to change? No, you have to change. Okay, you're broke. Who's to blame? Society? It up? Nope, it's you. You're going to have to change. The moment you do that, you know, everything is going to change for you. Again, a big pill to swallow, but an important one. Okay, so let's talk about uh, continuing with uh, having a winning team, being humble is being tenacious. And that means he calls it hungry. So again, there's in this video, there's a clip of Jack Canfield telling the story about a chiropractor and that he had all these kind of haters that said, you know what, you know, what don't even bother putting up a practice, a chiropractor office here. We already have several chiropractors. It's, it's swamped. It's dumb. You don't do it. All this other kind of stuff. And guess what? He did it, right? And so if anytime you're having somebody hating upon you, trying to believe that you're not possible, whether it's a family member, just listen to this very inspiring story and uh, and then we'll kind of discuss it. So uh, it's a long video, but I'm going to only show a clip from uh, three minutes and 20 seconds to seven minutes. So let's watch it right now. You're willing to decide what you want, believe it's possible, consciously envision the future, 
feel the feelings of what it would feel like if you had achieved this goal. You can have anything and then you take action, both obvious actions and inspired actions. You can do anything. One of the, the, the functions of belief is taking action. We did a survey of about 2000 top entrepreneurs and we noticed that one of the things that people who win in that world have is a bias for action. If they have an inspiration, they act on it. I mean, how many of you have ever had a great idea, talked about it, thought about it, didn't do it, and then someone else did it and was successful and you went, darn, I should have done that. Maybe it was buy that piece of property. You know, all that, we all have that piece of property we wish we'd bought, you know? <laughs> anyway, so we're gonna be looking at the idea that taking action is part of the law of attraction. See, a lot of people think you can just sit in your room, meditate, visualize having the perfect car, the perfect house, the perfect relationship, and then it'll kind of just come to you. And I always say, unless you live at the bottom of a hill, <laughs> where there's a road, it's probably not going to be a Cadillac show up in your living room, right? So think about this. The last six letters of the word attraction spell what? A-C-T-I-O-N, action. Now, there's two kinds of actions that are critical. There's obvious action. If you want a certain kind of car, you should go down and test drive it. You should find out how much it costs. You should see what it costs to maintain it. You should uh, go, you know, spend, I like to test drive a car three or four times, go down to the dealer, take a camera, stick my head out the window, say, take a picture of me, I'll be back to buy it. You know, put it up on my refrigerator, look at it every day. Eventually, you know, those kind of things produce car, right? Saving for it and so forth. But there are also things called inspired actions. All of a sudden you get an inspiration to do something and you didn't know what it was. You don't have a sense of like, how is this rationally going to make sense for me to move forward in my life? I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, Dr. Ignatius Piazza, graduates chiropractic school. He wants to move to Monterey near Pebble Beach where the golf course is. And he gets there and he says to the local chiropractic association, I'd like to join you, I'd like you to help me get my practice started. And they said, we don't need any more chiropractors. We have one chiropractor for every eight people in this area. It's too many. Now he could have said, okay, let the external reality control his internal experience, but he didn't do that. He said, I'm gonna, think about this and visualize it and believe in it and something will come that I will do. And what came to him to do was to take six months before he opened his office and put a pin where he wanted his office and then concentric circles, knock on every door in every neighborhood saying, hi, I'm a new doctor in town. Could I ask you a few questions? You know, I'm starting this practice. Should I open from five till nine in the morning and, or should I be open from five until nine at night for people who have nine to five jobs, which would be better. Should I advertise in this paper or that paper? Should I call it Ignatius Piazza Chiropractic or Chiropractic West? Then his last question was, if I have an open house, would you like to receive an invitation? They said, yes, he wrote it down. Now over six months, he knocked on 12,500 doors, talked to 6,500 people and gathered over 4,000 names of people who said, yes, I'd like an invitation to your open house. Now, when he opened his office six months later in a town that did not need another chiropractor, according to the professionals, his first month in practice, he netted $72,000. In his first year in practice, his gross income was over a million dollars. I was giving a talk and mentioned this story just about five years ago, and this happened about 25 years ago. Someone said, he knocked on my door. <laughs> and he left his card. And two years later, I needed the chiropractor and I called him because we work with people we know, we've had an experience with, right? So he trusted his intuition. He took action on it. Other people would say, oh, guess I can't have what I want. You got to be willing to take the action. If you're going to be successful. All right. So again, very powerful stuff. So I'd like to just check in with all of you. What are you getting from that video. <laughs> I just, uh, I'll just i just share with you while you're thinking about your comments, I'd love to for you to uh, actually share. I'll just say really quickly, number one, in terms of checking out uh, if, whether you want to get a new car, I do not believe in test driving it four times. If you watch that leadership library episode when I, I reviewed how to buy car for dummies and then I invited that guest speaker, William, there's a lot easier and faster ways to buy a car. So I definitely, if you ever want to lease or buy a new car, check out that video and he's going to uh, donate some money from every car purchase or lease uh, to elect a society. So uh, I encourage you to do that. And then the second thing is, is that uh, I wanted to share about what I got from that video is notice that he knocked on 6,500 homes. Like that is incredible. And just think about it. If you were to open up a practice, okay, how many clients do you really need 
in order to function as an office, right? <laughs> uh, chances are it might be 50 or 100. I, and again, I'm just using those numbers because I go to a chiropractor and, and she shared with me how many clients that she's had, right? So what does that mean? You have to go and knock on those all those doors and be willing that just through the power of numbers, we're going to talk about this later on in terms of how to win an ele election is 6,500 doors. Only 4,000 people said that they were interested in having, ha having uh, be contacted for the chiropractic. But then all he needs is like maybe 50 out of 100 of those people. So just knowing that it's a numbers game, it's just like you can win no matter what. It's just pure taking action, continuous action. Now, maybe there may be tweaks and getting that feedback from asking the constituents or what whatever they want. But Again, I'm not running for office right now, but I just know that the more I talk with people and connect with people, figure out what the issues that they want and be able to come from love and want to help and support them, I could run. I could do it. It just takes a lot of time, energy, and effort. But if your why is big enough, you'll accomplish anything. So again, who'd like to share what they got from watching uh, that video? Don't be shy. Any comments, thoughts, feedback? Hey, I'll say something quick because my mom is playing music in the back. I don't but, worry. Uh, I, don't, I don't even hear it. Go ahead, Shania. Great to hear you. Okay, it. cool. Um, so what I got from the video is that it's not enough to like just have a like belief. Like it's not enough wanting something. Yeah. Like, hey, I want it and like, having it in your brain and thinking about it. I mean, that's cool to do that, but you also have to take action and like you have to um like you have to do the work and <laughs> yeah like you have to do the work and I feel like like when I was watching that video and like what you've been talking about I've been like connecting it to like my situation currently right now because I'm trying to learn how to swim mm. and so my first few lessons I was like so scared and like I would like not drown but like my body was sink because I was just so fearful and because I'm so fearful like my body tense up but yeah. I've been looking at videos and been listening to my instructor and he'll tell me like I just have to believe like I have to trust the like trust the water trust my weight and trust my body that I'm not gonna drown if you know my body I just have to trust myself and then once I've been doing that like my last lesson I felt pretty good like I've been like doing it without a floaty so I'm really happy about that um and the the action that I'm taking is like I'm I'm going to the to YMP see eight like days like besides the time of my lesson because the lesson's only an hour a week and that's not enough for me so I, I'm actually going like this Saturday and I'm just trying to go days where I have time to do to put in the extra work to learning how to swim so yeah I really do believe like if you really want something that you you really have to put in the work for you to like get what you really want because that's when it like I think that's what it means it means more because like you know what you want and the, the fact that you're doing it you receive more satisfaction with that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's perfect. Now, again, I'm not asking you the reasons why you want to swim, but you can ask yourself, there is a deep motivation for you and a desire, right? It's an emotional thing. Like, I want to do that, right? Imagine if it's like, you know, fill in whatever reason might be so that I could, you know, go to a family vacation with my family or whatever it is so that I can be in the ocean. You know, there could all be a whole deary, a series of different drivers that's going to motivate a person and the more that it's constructive and coming from that level, guess what? You're going to learn faster. Now, the thing that I really love, Shania, about what you said about swimming, it's the perfect analogy for everything that we're talking about here. Do you know that humans can float? Okay. You don't have to do anything and you can literally float on water. But people how many times drown <laughs> you know how can you drown if you float well guess what it's all about your mind right it's what you're thinking i don't know how to swim then you start going down and then you start swallowing water and then you feel like you're dying again all that leads everything that we're talking about the moment that you doubt it leads to all these emotions fears and then your actions you know so you know squandering you know trying to and then you drown so again if you would just calm your mind release your fears, right? And again, in order for you to do that, 
you'd have to do that and take that practice. That's why I'm so amazed that that right now in today's day and age, they're able to teach infants how to swim, right? And that there's this technique of like where they're swimming and then they just are trained to just flip over. So that means that your child or some child that you know could end up being near a pool, fall in completely unsupervised and then be trained itself to turn on its back and float there and, and just, you know, hang out and chill out and start crying until somebody gets them. Like that's what's possible if we teach people how to do this. And you, if you can teach it to infant, you can teach it to anybody else. So again, this, I, Shania, I'm so glad that you brought it up because it's everything about what we're talking about, winning, manifesting, you know, believing in yourself, doing it, being trained. This is what it's all about. So let's go into the third and final aspect of a winning team is you need people who are people smart. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there is a famous book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And in this book, it outlines 29 principles that you need in order to win friends and influence people. And again, if you're going to be people smart, then you have to be able to be influential, be liked, develop friendships. And so I'm just going to highlight a couple of these of what he shared was uh, some of these principles. So the first one, which I think is very powerful, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Plain, right? Easier said than done. But here's what he says. Criticism is futile because it puts a person in defensive mode, right? And it usually makes him or her strive to justify themselves. So the moment that I would quote, call it your ego, you try to win an argument, win a debate, you know, make a person feel bad, right? Guess what? You're no longer winning, you know, you're no longer influencing that person, right? Their own ego is going to be triggered. They're going to want to be defensive. And then they're just going to say, huh, I want to justify my beliefs and I'm going to stick to them. And now they're, you're like a stick in the mud and you can't move them. That is the opposite of what we're trying to teach here in elective society, right? We're trying to teach you to be hum humble, uh, use your power and influence to create change, not always just demonize uh, people that you disagree with. Otherwise, guess what? We're not going to you know, have constructive, positive outcomes. So here's the, another principle that's in the book arouse an e uh, in the other person an eager want again this is all based on level one refresher where we talked about uh you know how to be more influential uh understanding what's in it for me the with them right how can i influence you if you if i actually don't know what you want or what you care about so that is the main purpose of a leader is to always to find out it's like well what do you want what do you care about how can i help support you it, it's it's throughout all history you know it's why Tyrion lannister in the game of thrones was so successful he was uh, on his about to be killed like who knows how many times and guess what he was able to outsmart and figure out what his captors wanted and was able to promise it to them or deliver it to them so that they couldn't kill him. So he was just a master at influencing people, had the gift of gab, right? So uh, there's a quote from Henry Ford. If there's one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person angle as well as uh, as from your own. So again, to me, I use this principle in sales and persuasion. It's like, how can I convince you to buy my product, service, or whatever if I can't even understand what you're worried about, what your fear is, right? Let's address it. Let's tell me why you don't want this thing. And then once I acknowledge, and this is why I put a little quote from uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, a, a good a good communicator, which I believe he is, will always try to make sure I want to understand your point of view. So they'll repeat it, they'll regurgitate. So correct me if I'm wrong. This is what you're saying, and this is what you care about. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, got it. Then let's work together for us to make sure that we win together. And I, you know, how many examples have I given throughout all level one and level two, sharing stories about the bosses, uh, the managers that I had that everybody hated? But guess what? I had a great relationship with them. Why? Because I figured out what they wanted and I tried to work together with them. Everybody was too busy judging them to actually figure out what that person wants. So this is the way in which you can be more influential and you can be people smart, okay? And then the last one 
that I'm going to highlight from here from the book is principle number 10. The only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it completely. So again, this is a quote from Benjamin Franklin. If you argue and rankle and contradict, you may achieve a victory sometimes, but it will be an empty victory because you will never gain your opponent's goodwill. And again, ben Benjamin Franklin was a master at influencing people, being very persuasive, not to make enemies and things like that, because he never wavered right? He still got what he wanted because he wouldn't demonize them. He wouldn't make them like, like the first principle, argue, criticize them, insult them because he needed to ch change their perspective. And the moment that you do that, guess what? Uh, it's not working. And that's why so many uh, people, whether it's in these different movements, uh, whether it's either if it's at college, you know, demonizing the administration, uh, you know, protesting, yelling like, well, first, before you jump into that, why don't you figure out what does the administration want? Why is it that they want what they want? What are their fears? What, what do they want to accomplish? Same thing with politicians or whatever. Okay, wh what do you care about? Why is this so important? Only when they are heard can and, and, and can you try to convince them. So that's why I really, you know, it, it frustrates me because I see on the news Whenever there's these capital hearings and there and there are these politicians arguing with all, all these different people, trying to put them on the spot, make them look stupid, even though I agree with that politician or whatever, or disagree with the person they're interviewing, I'm saying, guess what? You're not. You're you're just trying to make points. You're just trying to win elections. You're not actually really trying to ask questions, learn from this person's perspective, and then do what I did in my last training with I showed you, I think it was at the end of level one, where I talked about being humble and openness to criticism, where I talked about Columbo and the Socratic method, where you can actually ask questions, and then you see people trip themselves on up and have them discover it, you know, uh, get them to change their mind or get them to contradict so that you can catch them in her in their lies. That's what you want to actually people to see or uh, or feel or see their cognitive bias that's preventing them from doing what's in the best interests of the American people, etc. Okay, so I'm off my soapbox now. All right, uh, last principle. Okay, here's I promised one more. Uh, show respect for the other person's opinion and never say you're wrong. So even though in level one I showed a great video from Jordan Peterson who basically uh, did a great job as a psychotherapist or psychologist, really knowing how to communicate, repeating people back to people what they're saying and not moving on until you really got what they're trying to say. Well, in that same it, you know, instance, Jordan Peterson was on the interview with Kathy Newman, and he's like, you're wrong. And then he says, gotcha. You know, again, uh, he later on regretted saying gotcha in a subsequent interview. But guess what? He was being attacked by Kathy Newman, and he felt, uh, you know, I would assert his ego was triggered. And so that's why he'd be wanted to win. And guess what? Now, Kathy Newman, you know, is not in a, you know, from the last, at least last I heard, is at odds and ends. She defended herself, attacked Jordan Peterson, said that she, he was attacking her, the trolls got them, all because, again, he wasn't in this instance trying to persuade and influence her. He was trying to be right. And he was trying to win. And when you do that, it just doesn't work. So uh, we sometimes find ourselves changing our minds without any resistance or heavy emotion. But if we if but if we are told we are wrong, we resent the imputation and we harden our hearts. And that's the last thing that you want to do uh, with people. So, OK, let's talk about. One other uh, principle, personality ethic versus the character ethic. So seven habits of highly effective people. So remember uh, what Stephen Covey was basically in his book, criticized Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. He basically said, oh, yeah, smile more, remember people's name. Again, I didn't cover all the different principles of this book, but he said that that is called the personality ethic. You're trying to win because you want to be likable and be personable. So if you've ever seen the Broadway play Hamilton, which you all know that I very love, that would be an example of Aaron Burr. Throughout the whole entire show, he's being criticized. He tells Hamilton, don't know, don't let people know what you're against or what you're for. Or, you know, smile more. People don't know what 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 uh, what what issues he really cares about. Why? 
is he's because he's trying to appeal to everybody to get everybody to like him. And then there's that line in, in, in the, in the show where it's like, I, I like Hamilton. He, it looks like, I, I, excuse me, I like Aaron Burr. It feels like you can have a beer with him, right? Because again, you know, being likable is very important, but it's not authentic. It's not long lasting. Again, Aaron Burr doesn't go down in the history books as being a successful leader, you know? So don't fake it till you make it. Don't fake interest to get people to like you just because, you know, they like golf. So you pretend like you like golf too. No, you know, don't try to have a power look to look tough. You know, people can see right through that. Don't smile just for the sake of smiling. Yeah, smiling is very good. You know, it's very disarming laughing. I, you know, I always talk about that but that's not an example of, of, of a good leader. But Covey talks about the character ethic. This is the foundation of success. So it's, it comes from humility, integrity, courage, patience, and the golden rule. Treat others how you would like to be treated, or as one of my friend and colleagues once said, to treat others how they would like to be treated, right? And so the perfect example is George Washington. And I recently became obsessed with the TV show, which I highly recommend. It was on AMC several years ago. It's called Washington's, uh, oh, it's called Turn, Washington Spies. And the reason why it's so good is because you know, George Washington had a series of spies uh, to basically spy on the British so that they could win the war. And it's all about his story, the spy stories. And my wife for my, my birthday, because I live on Port Washington in New York, right here on Long Island. Long Island also has a location called Setauket. And we, uh, we, for my birthday, she took me out on a bike tour and we learned all about the different Washington spies that lived there and was able to pass information. And I, I really love the show. I couldn't stop watching it because you could actually see the leadership in George Washington in that show and things like like that. So again, in case you want to binge watch something, uh, if you like a little drama, good entertainment and stuff like that, and really good with a positive message in the end, definitely watch it. Okay. So this, this training is still all about winning. How can you win? Well, the best place to learn on how to win is the number one winning basketball player of all time. And that's Michael Jordan. So Let's just see what his quotes uh, are and if it resonates with everything that we've been learning so far in this training. If you quit once, it becomes a habit. So you just never quit, right? Never say never because limits like fears are often just an illusion, right? I can accept failure. Everyone fails at something, but I can't accept not trying again. And I failed over and over again in my life and that is why I succeed. Uh, again, the people who fail, it's because they, they, they quit after they fail. No one ever actually teaches you in order for you to be successful, you actually have to quit. Uh, excuse me. You have to fail many times in order that every time you fail, you learn something to be better and better and better and better. And if you just have that tenacity and you don't give up, well, guess what? Eventually you're going to succeed. So whenever you meet famous people, famous speakers and stuff like that. And it's like, wow, this is such a great big speaker. Well, how come I never heard about them before? Well, guess what? You didn't hear about them for 10 years when they were growing their network, when they were growing their movement, when they were writing books and nobody was reading them, but just kept at it and added at it because it was a passion. It was constructive. It came from emotion. It came from something that they love. And that's what happened with Michael Jordan. He would stay later on those on that field, uh, having practices when everybody else wanted to go home because he wanted to be the best player that he could be. So talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. So uh, again, everything that we're saying is in alignment with this whole training. So we're going to conclude with the whole idea of the seven steps to win an election, right? Uh, again, I, I'm not going to go into depth on this. This is just one slide, just because I promised, you know, this, this training was going to be about winning in your life, your career and in politics. So again, I was uh, very successful in politics when I was in college. I ran uh, as president of the student government. And so 
everything, any person who wants to run with anything has to do these fundamental things. So again, this is something you can always watch later at a future time. If this is a topic that you want to, us to dive into more, if you want to run uh, for politics or something like that, I can actually do that for a level training number three or, or et cetera. So uh, we're going to have a survey at the end of this post assessment where I'm going to be uh, asking you questions on what kind of trainings you would like to see for level three. So number one, you have to understand your why, right? What that, that goes into the manifestation formula. Why are you running? What are the issues you care about? Why it's so important? If you don't have that why, if it's just for fame, for popularity, it's not lasting, right? You're not going to have the strength to carry on. Run as a team. So that means, right? Oh, that's the whole theme of this whole training is by yourself, not successful. With a bunch of people, you're stronger together. Think of the spaghetti. One brand, one, one spaghetti, boom, broken. A bunch of spaghetti, you can't break it, right? Establish a platform. So what are your ideas? What are the things that you really care about and that 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 uh, really cares about people? And guess what? You might say, I don't know what to run on. Well, guess what? If you interview all these different residents or people in your community and ask them what they want, and if you can find patterns or themes like I did in that training, you know, uh, why SGAs fail uh, and accomplish a very little and how to fix it, I talk about developing a platform, developing five key priorities that you want to get accomplished, right? Uh, and that's how you do it. You interview, you ask questions, you do a survey. Then you have to prepare and plan. So you have to have a whole strategy. Uh, you have to create your elevator pitches. And then you actually have to campaign. You have to go out to people, share with your pitches, share your ideas, go door to door, right? And then what else also is going to really help you is people knowing that you learn from that book, uh, which is called uh, psych uh, influence the psychology of persuasion, you know that people will look to other people to vouch, right, for credibility. So the more uh, different endorsements that you get from established organizations, hey, this organization says we should vote for this candidate. People like that because then they don't have to think, they don't have to research because they're busy living their lives. So the more endorsements that you get from people that you trust, the more likely that that person is going to vote you for you. And that means meeting up with them, you know, understanding what they care about, right? And then finally, remember, uh, and from uh, power and influence as part of level one training is you got to get commitment from people, whether it's an event, asking them, hey, are you going to be at the event, whether it's going to be a voter, hey, can I count on you to vote for me? You know, will you vote for me? And whether they say, I'll think about it, <laughs> well, that means you got more work to do. If it's a no, okay, well, why is it a no? Because you need to learn and understand. And then you could, if you, maybe you disagree, okay, I respect you for not vo voting for me. Okay. And I get it. My issues are not in line with you. I wish you the best of luck. Move on. Guess what? <laughs> That person will respect you, you know, because you're not trying to pretend to be anything that you're not, right? You just disagree. And then if they say yes, guess what? When they walk into that booth, they're going to remember that they said yes, that they were going to vote for you. So they're going to be more likely to actually cast that vote. So it's a numbers game, more time, more effort, the more you win. So let's recap. We basically talked about the manifestation formula. Vision, belief, emotion, that's constructive and continuous action. We talked about the winning team player formula being humble, hungry, or tenacious and people smart, right? And then we talked about, you know, operating from the character ethic, not the personality ethic. That example is George Washington. And then how do you beat the haters? Well, guess what? You just take action continuously. And then as you're taking action, you collect feedback, right? And then once you take that feedback, you have to then adjust and say, all right, well, then I'm going to take more action, right? And then uh, from the quotes, all those quotes from Michael Jordan, if I were to summarize, guess what? You need to keep failing in order to succeed. So how many times do you send something and doesn't work out? Oh, okay, well, at least I did something. I, it didn't get the outcome I wanted. So now I'm going to keep trying till I get the outcome that I do want. That is what separates the people that win from the people that don't, right? Uh, and I, there's so many stories throughout history. You know, Abraham Lincoln lost elections before he actually became president of the United States. Again, these aren't things that are really talked about. You just think that people succeed left or right. It's like, no, there's a lot that people need to learn and fail. And then in terms of your elections, know your why, run as this team, have a platform, plan and prepare, have an elevator pitch and campaign, get endorsements, 
and then get commitments on uh, from your voters to that they're going to vote for you. So, all right, that's the end of uh, level two training. We're going to jump into the QA and Q and A, but before I do, I want to give you guys a sneak peek at uh, level three. So again, these are topics that I've been dying that I wanted to cover. Uh, that I just haven't had the time. So over the next month and a half, right now it's it's we're in the, almost the middle of October. So I'm going to use the month of October and November to really pull all these different types of trainings together so that they'll be ready for December. So that uh, there's a bunch of students that are going through level one right now. You guys are actually going through level two and there's some other people that need to watch recordings. So uh, we'll have some time over the next month or so to catch up on all those recordings. But guess what? I like to have as many people watch and participate in the level three trainings. And so the first one topic that I'm really care about and interested is who are the people and organizations that actually control and run the world, okay? And what can we do about it? So again, I know that there might be a lot of different conspiracy theories and things like that, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to do a deep dive. I want to research it. You know, uh, what is it about this deep state that we keep hearing? You know, is there a bureaucracy? Is there a uh, military industrial complex? You know, is it big tech that runs our world? Is it pharmaceuticals? So I want to tackle these questions. Uh, about figuring out because elective society was all about increasing your power and influence so that you can help serve others. So we need to know who's in power and who we need to influence and what we need to do about it so that we create the world that we're trying to create. You know, something that's positive comes from love, uh, that you are the light in the room and, and, and that we accomplish amazing things. So again, it's a topic I'm really excited about and want to cover. The second topic is just my story, right? Lessons from this COVID pandemic. You know, I, I knew about this pandemic, you know, in, in January 2020, meaning it wasn't until March and still, and, and until you actually heard all about the news. How did I know before the rest of the world uh, mostly knew, right? It's because I actually figured out who are the people that I trust and listen to that are telling me information because we're not getting the type of information that we need in our news media. And it was really shocking, you know, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to uh, do a deep dive into it, but I am going to do a significant portion talking about the vaccines because, again, my wife chose to get one. Uh, she was afraid. You know, uh, I, I encouraged her based on all the research that I've done and all the people I trusted to get the Johnson and Johnson versus the 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 others. And so, um, you know, and I, you'd be surprised on how what really happened. How I was demonized by my friends and family. You know, uh, I was you know accused of being a Trumper and all these other kind of things. And guess what? There are lessons for us to learn about this whole pandemic. And guess what? I think it was a blessing, right? You know, despite all the terrible things that happened, I think that there is something very important because I we really got to see who are the people that spoke the truth and who are the people that lied to us, right? And who are the people who actually got it wrong? So now moving forward, I want to listen to the people who actually had the right predictions, knew what was happening, and that wasn't uh, actually in the media, that were called conspiracy theorists that turned out to be right, you know, the scientific studies, and what are the new studies coming out, and stuff like that. So I'm going to do a deep dive into that. And then uh, something that I also find very fascinating is what's not taught in the history books. So a different history of the world and the lesson learned from fallen ancient civilizations. You know, I'm a big person that is really in love with discovering uh, our past and our history. And why is it that civilizations have fallen? And, and there are there is evidence out there that we've had past civilizations, whether it, that it's Atlantis, uh, the land of Mu, uh, you know, Lemuria. Uh, again, a lot of these interesting things, geological evidence is coming out. We're discovering new things. Uh, uh, again, if you want to watch Ancient Aliens, you know, their, their whole theme is, you know, everything comes from aliens, but maybe not, right? Maybe there is something, but the, the, there is that even scholars are now starting to agree there, there are ancient civilizations. So I'm going to bring you information that I've learned from the different books I've read. And guess what? It's going to give you and help you uh, with a blueprint on how you want to live your life. 
moving forward so we don't uh, become one of those fallen ancient civilizations. Okay. And then uh, lastly, uh, I, I've been inspired and motivated. I still want elective society to be free for all these students because I don't want money to be a reason why you can't benefit from this leadership education, but I am going to create a Patreon. Uh, I'm going to do a, not, not in this survey, but in, in shortly, I'm going to email and text people about uh, doing a Patreon survey because I want to see people who want to help support and grow elective society. There's a lot I'm not at a place where I can do this full time, but I'd like to be able to. And there's a lot more work that I like to be able to do from from actually becoming incorporated as a 501c3. So that's going to be a lot of legal fees, and I have to get all that 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 paperwork and stuff done. Uh, you know, and so until I get that point, I still want it free. But if there are people who are working and like to make a small donation on a monthly basis, whether it's $1, $5 a month or whatever it may be, you're going to be a patron founder of Electus Society. So, uh, you know, I'm still brainstorming what the kind of things that I can do to give away for people who are patron members, whether it's a one hour coaching session with me, uh, whether it's a, an additional hour of me helping you do a job interview. Uh, I, I'm thinking about putting you on the website to say, these are the people people who are our founders, who are helping to make sure all this happen. Maybe uh, once in a while, I might send out some free stuff to you or just give you discounts to the store or the shop that's on our website. Again, these are some items that you can see. We have cups, a graduation medallion, t-shirts, sweaters, and stuff like that. You can all get that now if you're interested. But uh, again, so I'm going to brainstorm. I want all of you to brainstorm as well so that we can do that. So please uh, fill out the post-assessment survey. I'm going to copy a link right now in the uh, in the chat. Let me just see if I have the chat uh, open and I can paste it. Control paste. Yep. This should be the 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 Google survey. And the last questions ask, what are some additional topics, you know, that uh, you would like? to um, uh, cover in level three, right? I mentioned just three of them. Uh, another fourth one that I was thinking about is how to start your own business or side hustle. So I can explain my experiences that I learned from starting my own business, you know, Duffy Leadership Incorporated as an S corporation, mistakes, lesson learns, whether when I was a COO of two startups. Again, that's another idea that I wanted to share with all of you since you may all have a side hustle. But again, any other topics, please share them. And also there's a question. Right now, Electus Society was all about mentorship, right? So I've been being a mentor to you, but you've gone through level one and level two. So you now have a good solid foundation of what it takes to be a leader as an executive level. But guess what? I'm now recruiting more students at colleges and universities from the rest of the country who want to be an elective society. So they're going to be looking for mentors. So I'm, I have on that survey a question, would you like to be a mentor? You know, and what topics would you like to talk about with people? Maybe you're an environmental studies major. So you maybe want to talk about environment or topics. So maybe there might be when everybody fills out applications and I find that there's a couple of people that are studying environmental science. Hey, just say, I'm interested in being a mentor. These are the topics I want to help and support people in. I can connect you as buddies, right? This is all part of the networking experience. So just let me know if you want to be a mentor, what topics you like to be able to help and support students on. Um, and it's and you don't have to give advice. You just have to share your stories. You just have to share your experiences in your college, at your job or your work so that they can then learn from your successes, mistakes. I never really try to give advice to people in any of my coaching sessions. I just basically share my experience and have genuine conversations and I leave it up to them. And I ask them to trust their higher self in guiding them in their actions. So uh, I think that, okay. Oh, Shania, yes, that's awesome. And Beth, yes, if you buy the t-shirt and you like a loose fit, order one size up. Yes, the shirts that you buy for the size, they're snug fit, right? So if you like it looser, buy a, a bigger size. So right now I wear shirts that are medium, and so what uh, I'm, but I'm starting to get larger. So I bought a large for the Electus Society shirt, you know, because again, I don't really operate it. I, I have a third party vendor that's handling all of it. 
And then, uh, and then what ends up happening, it's still kind of tight. So order a size up. So thanks so much, Beth, uh, for recommending that. And yes, Kieran, you'd be fantastic mentor. I know that you're already in your profession doing amazing things. I just, I'd love to be able to connect you with some other people who might be interested. And, 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 and again, uh, it might be more than one. So maybe it just might be a couple students and it's not going to be a lot of work. It's just calling them, reaching out to them uh, and say, hey, I'm from Electus Society. I'm one of the you know mentors. I'm a level three member now right because you've all completed this and so uh you know how can i help you let's talk you know and and, and you never know you create linkedin message connections and who knows uh, you'll be able to help each other so again it's something that i wanted to make happen and it's happening so does anybody have questions so far uh about this training about winning the manifestation formula winning as a team or any questions about elective society level three uh mentorship anything like or any comments you want to share the floor is open uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts before we close so who'd like to go i can go okay um, actually actually um you kind of touched on some communication skills yeah. Um, and you've kind of touched on some uh, emotional intelligence stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think in level three, I would like to actually in level one, I would like to see a lot more of that because um, as someone who majored in interpersonal communications and and someone who's lived a lot of life at 62, um, I understand how important those things are. And I wish when I was in my 20s, I knew everything I know about those two subjects now. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, yeah, I would I would love to be one of the mentors because I actually teach those skills. Yes. Um, but I would like to see that at a level one only because you have more people at a level one and they're younger. Yep. And the, the earlier that you learn those skills, the better off you are in your life overall. Like like learning how to fight fair if you're arguing with your significant other or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That's learning how to fight fair will save all of your relationships because every relationship has conflicts, and knowing how to argue without damaging the other person is probably one of the most important skills you can learn. Um, so I, I would really like to see that. All right. I, I like that. So add that as a topic for level three and doing a deep dive in communication. And now you're right. And, and you actually just inspired me and, and it reminded me of something that I've been thinking about uh, before. So yes, I would say right now I have level one. What I focus on level one in terms of communication, which is first practice repeating back to what the other people are saying, right? Don't argue, don't criticize and stuff like that. And then I only touch upon it a little bit uh, just in through stories that, especially when it comes to conflict with people or relationships, just repeating and understanding their point of view is, is like the most basic fundamental thing in communication. But then what I would add is that re recognize that you can make requests for people, right? Where it's like, you can actually make a request to somebody and they can either accept it, decline it, or count or offer it. But what I'd like to be able to do is 100%. Right now, this year, I, I, I've been I've been meeting with a lot of students uh, right now who are just entering level one. And they ask me, tell me about elective society. And I say, well, level uh, elective society is in its infancy, right? It was just an idea in, in 2021, right? It's now 2022. And it's only a second year old, right? And so think of it, if it was like a, a, a person that's alive right now, it's a toddler. So it's just starting to uh, stand up and walk on its legs, right? But there's so much more that it has to grow, right? What you see right now, you are all part of a founding of this organization because I don't want it to be all about me. And exactly what you're saying, Beth, is uh, this, this season was the first time where I actually invited Henry Edwards actually served as a guest because uh, for one of my trainings. And so that is something that I want to do more in the future is if any elected society members shares with me that they say, Tim, this is the topic that I really care about. And I want to actually be part of the training. Well, then guess what? Let's make it happen. So it's not me doing all the trainings and you sharing your stories. And it could be something as small as uh, one, 
planning ahead of time. If I'm going to talk about this topic, share your story and what you learn from it and see what else anyone gets. Or it could be something much more formal where you actually have a presentation, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, part of that training or a whole thing, you know, uh, an hour training and with, with exercises and Q&A, I'm open to that. So please put that down in the survey of what would you like for, for, for level three, uh, that question, Beth, and anybody else, what are the topics that you want to cover and maybe some other things that you'd like to talk about or present on as well. Okay. So thanks so much for that suggestion, Beth. I really appreciate it. Is there anybody else, uh, any other questions or comments? This is level. This is level two completion, people. <laughs> I just wanted to express how much I really do appreciate these trainings, and that it really do help my personal life. Um, and I try, like I always, like anytime I'm going through something, I always try to think back of the trainings, and I'm like, what would Tim do? So <laughs> um, it's Thank been you. really helpful. And I look forward to level three and more to come. I love that. And I appreciate the compliment and I got it. And thank you so much for that. And my invitation for you, remember, I don't coach people, right? I don't tell them what to do. I just do invitations. I invite you to think about because my invitation for you would be whenever you're running into a difficult situation, especially now that you've completed this level two training is to say, not what would Tim do, but what would my higher self do, right? It's about, uh, you know, quieting your mind, quieting all the fears, because again, you're on your own journey, Shania, just like everybody else. And only your true higher self is going to guide you to the right actions. And even if they seem wrong at the time, there are lessons, uh, there's lessons to learn from that. That relationship was terrible. I can't believe I dated that guy, that girl, whoever, guess what? You learn something, all right, about that relationship. You learn something about yourself, you know. And if you don't learn those lessons, guess what? You're going to keep dating that person. <laughs> Why do I keep meeting these same people? Well, you haven't learned the lesson, right? So listen to your higher self, and your your growth uh, will actually move much faster. So thanks again, Shania. I really appreciate. It. Uh, thanks for the heart, uh, Kieran. Are you you're level two? Uh, you know, uh, graduate. Uh, you know, now actually joining in on some of these trainings. I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself. Would love to hear from you. Any other final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Um, I, well, I can't believe I completed um, level one, level two, and now coming back for some of these trainings and then hearing all the new elective society members joining in on these trainings and just I mean, for me, as a recent graduate of both, like, it's kind of nice to come back to these trainings to just also kind of reflect on the concepts that I learned from each one and then the expanded parts um, of the lessons. I feel like they, they still are really helpful. Uh, and just hearing from all the new members of what their thoughts on it are, because I know in my groups, like we used to have like, really long discussions on like each each one and now I'm hearing like the same thing from the new members so it's kind of nice to see the growth yeah Kieran, and I can't wait for level three so yeah me too I'm so excited <laughs> as well all right now, I'm excited. and you're gonna help you're gonna help all yeah right. I all just right. hope that more of uh the people that were with me in level one and level two come back and we kind of had that reunion, like that would be great for me. That would be really great. Yeah, yeah. I, I see you guys as the mentors for the level one members, you know, that are coming in, right? I'm going to do a whole round of recruiting right now. Uh, and and now because uh, I, we've recorded all these videos, and I'm going to make them available so people can watch them. That means more time to develop more trainings. And that means more time I can actually meet up with the members and have one-on-one -on -one introductory meetings. So I'm expanding my reach you know, using the power of technology, right? So there's no better time than right now to be able to reach more people, you know, let's create the next generation of leaders, let's become leaders of light, peace, and love, and uh, we're going to do great stuff together. So thank you so much, Kieran, we appreciate you and everybody else in Electus Society who's watching this video. All right, have a great night, everybody. Please fill out that post assessment. I look forward to reading all those responses. Bye-bye. Bye, Tim. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Tim. Bye.